So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as always, I want to thank everyone who's joined us here today. My name is Sydney Pickern, and I'm a staff attorney here at uh, Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. And I wanted to also um, give my co-panelist Elaine an opportunity to introduce herself. Good afternoon. My name is Elaine Lewis, and I'm a staff attorney at Redup. Nice to meet you all. Thanks, Elaine. So this training, as you can see, is titled Using Disability Rights Protections to Challenge Anti-Homelessness Ordinances. And before we begin, uh, I have just a couple housekeeping notes. Uh, we're asking that you please put your questions in the chat. And of course, we'll try to get to them at the end. Um, we'll also post our contact information at the end of the presentation in case folks want to reach out. Um, and uh, we will post the training on our housing policy page at dreadf.org. And we will also be sending the PowerPoint around to folks who registered for the training. Uh, very briefly, um, as many of you know, DREDF is a national law and policy center uh, by and for people with disabilities. And we work on a wide range of issues from uh, uh, disability rights issues from housing, healthcare, and education, and uh, including those. And also we are a support center for frontline legal service providers across the state which means that we are here to provide technical assistance on disability rights, including, of course, disability rights and housing. And so again, I want to thank you all for joining us. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, turn off my camera and also we're going to jump right in. So this is an overview of today's training, starting with you know, why, why this training is important, uh, moving on to uh, outlining some of the homelessness criminalization ordinances, and moving into relevant disability and constitutional laws, uh, then diving into disability rights protections. And then of course, we'll do our case review which will include uh, Martin v. City of Boise, McGarry v. City of Portland, Glover v. City of Laguna, Bloom v. City of San Diego, and then uh, last but not least, Venucci v. County of Sonoma. And then we'll do some key takeaways and then hopefully have time for questions. And so how did we get here? Uh, so this is information that you all as advocates will certainly be familiar with, but I think it's important to go over briefly to give some context to this human rights issue. So even before the pandemic, California was experiencing a homelessness crisis. We were and continue to be a state with one of the largest populations of people experiencing homelessness. And with COVID-19, of course, uh, and its potential to uh, continue to exacerbate um, this issue once the eviction moratoriums expire, we, we know that the homelessness crisis will continue to grow unless real equity-focused community solutions are funded and impl implemented. And with that being said, Historically, there have been a number of factors that have contributed to the large numbers of people experiencing homelessness in our state. And these include, of course, the limited availability of affordable and physically accessible housing, which means that people with disabilities have often been unable to find affordable housing that meets their physical access needs. Other relevant factors have included people having to choose between paying for their health care and housing. And of course, that wages and public benefits amounts are not in line with the high cost of living across the state and of course, across the country. These factors and others really contribute to the reality that 
many people who are experiencing homelessness are also people with disabilities. And uh, I also wanted to say, of course, that people of color also experience homelessness at high rates. And this is due to a number of factors, of course, um, including a history of systemic racism in local housing practices. All of this dovetails into the reality that despite the lack of affordable housing and emergency shelter space, and perhaps directly because of the growth of highly visible unsheltered homelessness, many cities have chosen to criminally or civilly punish people living on the street for doing what any human being must do to survive. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Elaine to uh, walk through this slide. Uh, thanks, Sid. Um, this slide illustrates the different types of ordinances and enforcement activities that local jurisdictions have been and continue to utilize to ticket, arrest, harass, and jail people for life-sustaining conduct. That includes camping bans, evictions of encampments, also known as sweeps, bans on sleeping, bans on sitting or lying down, restrictions on living in vehicles, bans on begging, and bans on loitering, loafing, and vagrancy. These policies and their enforcement are often referred to collectively as the criminalization of homelessness. Even though these laws are punishable as both criminal and civil offenses, Hey, thanks, Elaine. So moving into relevant disability and constitutional protections, increasingly legal challenges to laws punishing sleeping and camping in public and challenges to the practice of homelessness sweeps have been successful on a variety of grounds. And of course, many of you are going to be familiar with the laws listed here, which come together to provide a powerful level of protection for people experiencing homelessness, including, of course, those with disabilities. So this is really just a sampling of relevant laws, a few, a few of which we'll get into a little deeper coming up. But for now, as many of you know, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, prohibits disability discrimination in state and local programs and covers service providers that contract with these entities to help administer these programs. And then of course, section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, or uh, as we'll call it section 504 for short, provides similar protections, but covers public and private entities that receive federal financial assistance. And then, the federal, the, the federal Fair Housing and Amendments Act of 1988, this was the first law that prohibited discrimination against people with disabilities in housing. And I've listed this one here because it can be helpful to look at um, FHAA zoning cases and reasonable accommodation, accommodation cases for similar arguments in this context. And of course, if there is a shelter program involved uh, the FHAA could be highly relevant as well. And then of course the Eighth Amendment challenges to anti-camping ordinances and enforcement. Plaintiffs argue that enforcement of such laws violate the Eighth Amendment uh, prohibition against cruel and, and unusual punishment. And we will be discussing a powerful Eighth Amendment case shortly, Martin v. City of Boise. Uh, evictions of, of encampments or sweeps of people experiencing homelessness have also been successfully challenged on Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment grounds when residents' possessions are confiscated or destroyed without adequate notice and other due process protections. This is not an exhaustive list. And I will definitely link the uh, National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty Housing Not Handcuffs litigation manual in the notes uh, for more information on you know, many of these cases and particularly the ones that uh, utilize these different constitutional protections. Uh, of course, we'd like to note here before we move on um, 
that, you know, um, the success in preventing criminal criminalization of homelessness one case at a time, you know, may not achieve the long term goal of ending homelessness by ensuring that all Californians and all Americans have access to safe and affordable housing in neighborhoods of opportunity. And so it's critical that litigation strategies support local organizing and policy advocacy efforts so that ultimately we can help secure solutions to the underlying cause of homelessness. And of course, we agree and we, we want to recognize that this is some of the most challenging advocacy that exists. And we want to definitely be cognizant of the advocates efforts, especially on this call in, in this area. And then uh, Elena is just gonna walk through this slide for us as well. Um, and so with that, we're going to dive into some of the disability rights fundamentals. And of course, many of you are going to be familiar with this statutory language from the ADA, which states that to establish a violation of Title II of the ADA, plaintiffs must prove that one, they're individuals with disabilities, two, they're otherwise qualified to participate in or receive the benefit of some public entity services, programs, or activities. Three, they were either excluded from participation in or denied the benefit of the public entity services, programs, or activities, or otherwise discriminated against by the public entity. And four, such exclusion, denial of benefits, or discrimination was by reason of their disabilities. We're going to talk about some of these elements in the cases section, but a couple of important points to emphasize is that Title II protects individuals not only from intentional discrimination or policies that have a disparate impact on disabled persons, but also from policies where public entities can make reasonable accommodations that are necessary to level the playing field. And of course, a violation of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 um, at 29 U.S.C. Section 794 requires the same showing as the ADA, but you must also show that the per program providing the benefits or services receives federal financial assistance. So usually you could just shortcut once you've got the ADA analysis. The real question with the Rehabilitation Act is that funding stream. And Sid. Thanks, Elaine. And so this slide is um, what uh, disability advocates often refer to as uh, the screen out prohibition. And so essentially, um, a public entity may not directly or through contractual or other arrangements deny a qualified individual with a disability the opportunity to participate in or benefit from the program. And then this is the part that's uh, distinct or use criteria or methods of administration that have the effect of discriminating on the basis of, of disability. And we'll also see a number of cases that uh, utilize this legal argument as well. And then I also wanted to highlight, of course, this reasonable accommodations regulation, because as we'll see, you know, many of the many of the cases also utilize this law. And so um, the slide says public entities are required to make reasonable modifications in policies, practices, or procedures when the modifications are necessary to avoid discrimination on the basis of disability. Unless, of course, the public entity can demonstrate that making the modification would fundamentally alter the nature of the service program or activity. And so the concept of reasonable accommodations is going to be familiar to many of you, whether you work with FHAA or ADA, that discrimination includes failure to, to accommodate. And I think it's important when we're looking at these cases that we're thinking about, you know, is there an accommodation that could work in this context? And then of course, even if you think that it's a long shot, consider making a reasonable accommodations request while you're working up your case. 
And so now we're going to go through some cases, uh, and we think these are helpful to help illustrate some of the disability rights arguments in the context of homelessness criminalization. And I marked here next to the case names some of the legal arguments that were utilized in the complaints and of course during later proceedings. Um, and I wanna say at least one of these cases has settled and one is still ongoing, but the legal arguments are of course very useful when we're thinking about our own case development. And uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Elaine for Martin v. Boise. Thanks. Um, so the first case we're going to look at more in depth is Martin v. Boys. Um, it's an Eighth Amendment challenge to an anti-camping ordinance and an anti-sleeping ordinance as well. So Martin involved uh, a pair of ordinances enacted in Boise, Ohio, Idaho, that criminalize either sleeping or camping in public places. Um, sleeping is pretty self-explanatory, but they defined camping as the use of public property as a temporary or permanent place of dwelling, lodging, or residence. So even if you weren't actually asleep, if you were in the public, um, in a public place and the police believe that you were camping, um, and it then you could be held liable under the ordinance. Um, with the facts that were established in the case, things as simple as having a blanket um, or any belongings with you in a public place were the kinds of factors that could be used to determine that someone was camping in a public place. Um, the plaintiffs challenged the two ordinances on the grounds that it violated the Eighth Amendment when applied to uh, people uh, experiencing homelessness who had no available alternative shelter. The city of Boise had three shelters available and um, it was made clear under the record that the shelter accommodations weren't available for everyone. There was just a, there was a larger point in time count of uh, people experiencing homelessness in, within the city than total shelter capacity. And also the record established the limitations for stays. So um, depending on whether or not you were male or female, uh, whether or not you agreed to enter into a religious training program, uh, limited the length of time that you could stay at any of the shelters. This is a very important element of the factual record that the court relied on to determine that as a practical matter, shelter, uh, shelter space was unavailable um, at times for certain people. Now, going back to the legal substantive issues, the Eighth Amendment Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause substantively limits what kinds of behavior can be criminalized. For example, the Supreme Court has said that it would be cruel and unusual punishment to sentence someone for even a day in prison for the, quote, crime of having the common cold. Uh, and that was in Robinson in 1962. So in Martin, the Ninth Circuit held that ordinances that criminalize lying, sitting, and sleeping, which are necessary activities to sustain human life, when there are no alternative shelter beds available whether because the shelters themselves are full or whether there are eligibility requirements. Um, actually, Sydney, could you go back? Okay. Um, violates the cruel and unusual punishment clause. And that's both for um, the acts of seating, sorry, the acts of sitting, sleeping, or lying down, and also for taking rudimentary precautions, such as wrapping oneself in a blanket or sleeping on a piece of cardboard to protect oneself from the elements while sleeping, sitting, and lying down. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, the court made clear in Martin that it was intended to be a narrow holding, and several subsequent courts have been enthusiastic about keeping the holding within as narrow bounds as possible. Um, so the holding provides that it's limited to people experiencing homelessness, and that needs to be involuntary. Martin doesn't cover someone who could afford a place to stay and chooses not to stay there or has some other suitable alternative living arrangement. 
uh, to there needs to be lack of available shelter beds, either by the total shelter capacity being full or there is no shelter bed that that particular person can access. For example, uh, if there's a limitation in days, they have religious objections. Uh, this should theoretically include lack of access to beds due to disability, but we have not yet seen rulings on this issue in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, for number three, you can't have total prohibitions on camping, but there have been cases that provide that it's okay, uh, district court cases post-Martin that say it's okay to have restrictions on time and place. Martin itself says time and place restrictions are okay. And um, some of the district court cases that follow it have said it's okay to require permits to camp. And that's in Gomez v. City of Kauai. Um, or to have prohibitions against camping in a particular place. So maybe the city can't say you can't camp at all within the city limits, but they could say you can't camp in Central Park, for example, or all the nice parks maybe. Uh, the fourth restriction is that there can't be criminal enforcement. And some cases post-Martin have been kind of all over the map on this issue. Some have said that Martin can be distinguished um, when there's civil enforcement. And so if police are uh, giving civil fines or otherwise civilly removing people from camping areas, some courts have said that that's fine. Other courts um, have said that it's not clear and they can't rule on that issue without further briefing. Fortunately, um, there's a general difficulty with this kind of litigation. Often we don't get to a final ruling. So uh, some cases haven't gone all that way. Um, but some cases have also said that um, Lake v. City of Grants Pass, for example, says that Martin does apply to civil and criminal enforcement. And so, um, the fourth prong is kind of an open question, whether it's just criminal or if it also extends to civil. And finally, um, Blake v. City of Grants Plants, which I mentioned earlier, also found post-Martin that fines at issue for uh, anti-camping, anti-sleeping ordinance also violate the Eighth Amendment excessive fines clause as well. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, and, you know, something I wanted to emphasize here, and, and I think advocates realized pretty, the, pretty early on when this case was moving up, um, that, you know, in Martin, we see in the context um, that shelters were unavailable based on length of stay rules and, and religious observation requirements. But, you know, I, I think advocates um, have been and, and will continue to utilize this argument for people with disabilities. And, you know, advocates can assert that shelters are inaccessible to people for a number of reasons, including, you know, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, physical access bar barriers, and therefore the criminalization ordinance should not be enforced, you know, based on um, Martin and based on the unavailabil unavailability of the shelter. And so, you know, that's one avenue that we can take in our disability rights advocacy. And we'll also, we'll see in a number of cases that, you know, advocates have indeed make, been making this argument in, in sort of one form or another, even before Martin was decided in the ninth. Um, and so we're gonna move on to McGarry v. City of Portland. And so uh, I'll quickly run through the facts of this case and then we'll talk about the holding. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Mayor McGarry v. City of Portland. This is a Ninth Circuit case from 2004 where Richard McGarry, a person with AIDS, brought suit against the City of Portland for disability discrimination in the context of a local nuisance ordinance, which required property owners to keep their outdoor areas free of trash and debris. So McGarry had difficulty complying with this ordinance because it was difficult for him to clean his yard because of his disability. So the city went in, cleaned his yard, 
charged him thousands of dollars for the cleaning. And then McGarry ended up selling his house and, and paying off the lien. So McGarry then sued the city for failure to provide a reasonable accommodation for more time to allow him to come into compliance with the ordinance. And so McGarry used the Fair, the Fair Housing Amendments Act and Title II of the ADA to support his failure uh, to accommodate claims. And we, we wanted to emphasize a couple of things here. So number one, the Ninth Circuit said that compliance with municipal code enforcement can constitute a benefit of the services, programs, or activities of a public entity under Title II, and that the specific benefit that McGarry sought in this case was to be allowed sufficient time to comply with the city's code enforcement activities in a manner consistent with his disability. And so the, the concept of compliance with enforcement of an ordinance is really uh, important because in these anti-camping and anti-sleeping anti cases, plaintiffs can and of course have identified that a benefit has been denied to them by the city in violation of these disability rights laws. And so when we're thinking again about these criminalization cases, it could also be that folks need an accommodation of additional time to comply with the laws or just that the benefit of compliance with the law is not available because no other accessible sleeping options exist. And the other important piece of this case is how it addresses the concept of disparate treatment. Here, the court acknowledges that the Ninth has repeatedly recognized that facially neutral policies may violate the ADA when such policies unduly burden disabled people, even when such policies are consistently enforced. That in terms of McGarry being discriminated against by quote, reason of his disability, that it didn't matter that non-disabled residents were also subject to the nuisance ordinance. That state action that disproportionately burdens the disabled because of their unique needs remains actionable under the ADA. And the court found that McGarry sufficiently alleged the discrimination by reason of his disability element and that the city's a nuisance abate abatement policy burdened him in a manner different from and greater than it burdened non-disabled residents. And, and this was solely as a result of his disabling condition. And so the, the Ninth Circuit in this case ended up reversing the judgment of the district court and remanded the case for further proceedings. Right. And the next case we're going to talk about is Glover v. City of Laguna Beach. This was a class action on behalf of individuals with disabilities experiencing homelessness challenging the city's anti-homeless enforcement and shelter program on Eighth Amendment and ADA and Rehabilitation Act grounds. Uh, important thing to flag, uh, the population uh, experiencing homelessness within the city had high rates of uh, disability. Um, so um, could you go to the next slide? Thanks. All right, so a little bit of background facts. The city of Laguna Beach operated a single 45 bed shelter, although approximately 100 individuals seek homelessness services within the city per month. Um, the, sh the single shelter is a, has a congregate setting with one single sleeping room with 45 thin mats on the floor. And those mats on the floor were difficult for people with mobility impairment to get in and out of, and um, also weren't very comfortable. So people who had chronic pain um, and other disabilities 
we're often poor, more poorly served by the sleeping uh, on mats on the floor. Residents were not allowed to leave the shelter premises at night. And that had also a difficult and disproportionate effect on people with a number of mental and developmental disabilities, because um, if you can imagine sleeping in a room with 45 strangers uh, can be stressful. Um, and sometimes people need to have, especially if you have uh, mental and intellectual disabilities, it's important to have a break from such a setting in order to be able to cope and manage. Um, but since people weren't allowed to leave the premises, in fact, weren't allowed to leave the sleeping room at a certain point, that had an adverse effect on people with disabilities. Moreover, the shelter transport van was not accessible for people with mobility impairments. And on top of this stressful environment of being in a room with 45 people and mats on the floor, there were also strict rules regarding noise and courteous behavior. And uh, the staff had the power to unilaterally, unilaterally eject residents for broadly defined misconduct. And so the, the, not only were there sort of arbitrary behavior standards, uh, it wasn't really clear how they'd be enforced and that in itself added stress for people um, with uh, certain disabilities, including people who are affected with PTSD or anxiety um, to not know when they might be kicked out at any time for a, a poorly defined reason. And so this, um, can we go to the next slide? Okay. Oh dear. Um, I think that you went back instead of forward. Oh. Okay, I think there might be a problem with the slides. So I'm just going to read um, what I have in my notes um, and we will send an updated version of the PowerPoint when we share it. Okay, so um, this case brought, as I mentioned before, an Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual punishment claim. It was basically a Martin claim, which lost on summary judgment um, without really a clear explanation. However, it's important to note that this decision was pre-Martin and it relied on Jones, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Glover was pre-Martin. And so the precedent that was relied on by the plaintiffs um, was non-binding case law that ultimately uh, was relied on by the court in Martin, but it wasn't available as binding Ninth Circuit, Ninth circuit precedent at the time of the uh, Glover case. Uh, the outcome on the Eighth Amendment claim likely would be decided differently with Martin's binding precedent. However, the ADA and Rehabilitation Act claims did find some success. Summary judgment was granted for the plaintiffs regarding the use of a physically inaccessible van. It's kind of a no-brainer. Um, you violate the ADA with um, an inaccessible van. Um, summary judgment was denied for both plaintiffs and defendants on the other disability claims because of the genuine issues of fact about whether um, the way the shelter programs were operated excluded, discriminated, or denied benefits uh, to residents with disabilities by reason of their disabilities. And it was also a genuine question of fact about whether modifications were necessary to, to avoid disability discrimination. The case itself settled in 2018, and the settlement provided for uh, a variety of reforms, including a mechanism for requesting disability accommodation to access the shelters, disability training for the shelter staff, and training for the police on interacting with people experiencing homelessness, a dedicated city staff person responsible for ensuring accessibility within the shelter, and a number of specific accommodations, such as wheelchair lifts for the shelter or van and cots instead of mats for those who need it. And in addition, um, the settlement provided for a pilot program that would uh, assess whether or not they could accommodate people who aren't able to sleep in a 45 bed congregate setting with individualized units as well.
and the dean. Thanks, Elaine, and I, I apologize about the slides. That was my mistake. Um, and thanks for that overview. That case is, uh, it's fascinating to go through um, everything that happened in, the, in that case. And so I definitely encourage advocates to let, take a look at it. Um, so moving into Bloom v. City of San Diego. And I just wanted to, of course, give a shout out to the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, Disability Rights California, and Disability Rights Advocates on, on this one. Uh, so this is sometimes referred to as a vehicle camping case. And again, uh, this case is ongoing. So we're going to go through the facts briefly, and then we'll talk about the legal arguments from the complaint and the motion to dismiss, which this case survived. So plaintiffs here are people with disabilities who, as it's stated in, in the complaint, due to their disabilities, particularly that they were unable to work because of their disabilities and therefore unable to afford housing, are experiencing homelessness and are forced to live out of their vehicles, again, specifically RVs, because the homeless shelters are not able to accommodate the plaintiff's disabilities. And so the plaintiffs here challenge two uh, San, Diego, San Diego Municipal Codes, number one, making it unlawful to use a vehicle as a living quarters, and then number two, to park RVs on city streets during the early morning. And so I wanted to highlight that before filing the complaint, plaintiffs made a reasonable accommodations request that the city allow homeless RV owners to use empty parking lots at night in non-residential neighborhoods. The city uh, ended up taking no action in response to the request and in fact continued to ticket uh, homeless RV owners, e even those who display disabled placards. And plaintiffs made an additional request for the city to halt enforcement the city refused, and then shortly thereafter, the complaint was filed. So plaintiff's complaint alleged uh, that these ordinances violate the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act because they place, again, here's the, the uh, disparate in, impact language, a, disport, a disproportionate burden on people with disabilities experiencing homelessness. And I've listed here the three ways that plaintiffs alleged uh, in which they were disproportionately burdened by the ordinances. And number one, plaintiffs that plaintiffs cannot simply stay at the city's homeless shelters as the shelters cannot accommodate plaintiffs' disabilities. That number two, plaintiffs' pre-existing conditions uh, make them more vulnerable to unsheltered homelessness if their RVs are impounded. And then number three, plaintiffs cannot access permanent housing since their disabilities preclude them from working and result in fixed incomes. And I think, you know, the last one here clearly draws on the Ninth Circuit's holding in Giebler that uh, accommodations can be made to address the financial limitations that arise from a disability. I also wanna point out that plaintiffs uh, alleged a failure to accommodate claim, which was essentially that the city violated uh, the disability rights laws by refusing to accommodate, to accommodate plaintiffs to allow them to legally park and use their vehicles for shelter at least until affordable, accessible, and medically appropriate housing is available for them. And on the motion to dismiss, the court talks about why plaintiff's disparate impact claim survives. And the court says, although the city's nighttime RV parking ordinance applies equally to all persons with RVs in the city, Taking plaintiff's allegations as true, 
its enforcement burdens disabled persons in a manner different and greater than it burdens others. And that, you know, that's obviously pulling from, from McGarry, but the court goes on to say, because of the unique dependence upon plaintiff's need for their RVs to live, the city's ordinances effectively deny these persons meaningful access to the city's services, programs, and activities, which are easily accessible by others. And so it's clear that, that this case is pretty mon monumental in terms of how it's using the law. And, and so I think it's good to be, it's, it's very good to be aware of it. And it's also something that we'll continue to be watching to see how it continues to unfold. And, and so just to reiterate, the court found for the plaintiffs on the city's motion to dismiss, and they also ended up enjoining enforcement of the of one of the laws, the vehicle habitation ordinance. But that was based, and it was via a preliminary injunction. But that was based on vagueness and arbitrary grounds. So these cases clearly are bringing in both disability rights protections and the, the many of the constitutional protections that we briefly discussed in the beginning. So last but certainly not least, again, we have Venucci v. County of Sonoma. And I wanna of course uh, give a thanks to uh, the California uh, Rural Legal Assistance and the Public Interest Law Project for this. For this one, there, there were a lot of pieces in this case, but in the interest of time, we're we're going to zero in on a couple on a couple of key pieces. So, this lawsuit was brought in the spring of 2018 by people with disabilities experiencing homelessness, and a local homelessness advocacy organization for the uh, disability discrimination and constitutional violations related to the enforcement of the city of Santa Rosa's anti-camping laws. And uh, in the disability rights context, the, the complaint utilized both disparate impact claims and failure to accommodate. And so plaintiffs requested that defendants postpone their planned sweep of the Roseland encampments in, in this case temporarily until adequate, until adequate alternative shelter had been offered to all residents as a reasonable accommodation. This, this accommodation was denied. Um, one of the many, many interesting things about this case and particularly when we're thinking about reasonable accommodations in light of inaccessible shelters is that at one point during the sweeps, the defendant did offer a few people temporary motel placements as a reasonable accommodation to the larger shelter setting. And so I think now, particularly in some jurisdictions that may have access to hotel and motel placements from the project room key and home key funding, as a result of the pandemic, thinking about these settings when you're setting up your disability arguments uh, could also be um, a good idea. Uh, and so another interesting point is that in the court order on the temporary restraining order, which plaintiffs uh, unfortunately weren't successful on, but, but they did ultimately get a stipulated preliminary injunction, which we'll talk about in a second, so on the TRO order, the court said, the common assumption that it's enough for the government simply to make temporary shelter beds available is likely wrong. Even if shelter beds are available, the ability of the government to take enforcement action against homeless people who are camping should depend on the adequacy of the conditions in the shelters. This is a particular concern for people with disabilities who sometimes struggle to see their needs met in temporary shelters. And quote, after all, 
many homeless people have disabilities. And so I use this quote because I think it's, it's becoming pretty clear that homelessness and disability are often very much tied together, which is a harsh reality for our community, but it also helps make room for the success of many of the arguments we've seen. And so in, in Venucci on July 12th, 2019, uh, the Northern District of California entered a stipulated preliminary injunction. And you know, the, the injunction applied to enforcement actions against homeless persons living on public property within the city of Santa Rosa and required that before the city or county take an enforcement action against a homeless individual who has established a dwelling outdoors, they must first provide that individual reasonable notice and make an offer of adequate shelter. Now, what's special about this injunction is that it defines adequate shelter based on a variety of factors, including of course, an individual's specific disability related needs, they're having a service animal or pet, their gender, and then their religious or ethical beliefs. And I just wanted to just very briefly, the, the language um, from the, in, from the uh, stipulated prelimin preliminary injunction where, where it defines adequate shelter, it says it may be permanent supportive housing or an emergency placement, including but not limited to shelter beds, transitional housing, and hotel vouchers. The adequacy of a shelter will depend on a person's individual circumstances, such as mental disability, physical disability, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, essential personal provisions and it, and it goes on. And so, and it says for some people, particularly those with certain mental health disabilities, a barrack style placement may not be adequate based on their individual circumstances. And so I think, you know, it, it's, this case is really useful um, for a number of reasons, but uh, part particularly in regards to this a stipulated preliminary injunction and how it defines this concept of, of adequate shelter. Um, so that, that sort of wraps us, wraps up our case, uh, case overviews. And so we just wanted to do a, sort of a, a quick key takeaway, a summary of some of the issues and also some of, some of the, um, some of the issues we may not have pointed out particularly. And so when thinking about a disability discrimination case in this context, you know, I think always you want to be collecting data on the number of people experiencing homelessness and chronic homelessness in your community. Chronic homelessness, of course, is um, people with multiple disabilities who've been experiencing homelessness for long periods of time. Uh, we, of course, want to be thinking about the disability-related needs in the context of the enforcement action, current homelessness assistance pro programs that are offered in the jurisdiction, potentially jail population demographics to see who, who are these folks that are uh, being penalized, um, and then Advocates should, should also seek to learn, of course, as much as possible about the ordinance or statute that will be challenged. And this includes developing a firm understanding of the law's enactment, the jurisdiction's history of and policies regarding the enforcement of the ordinance or statute, and of course, the municipality's relationship with shelters and other service providers and the difficulty that um, people with disabilities experiencing homelessness may have with complying with this ordinances. Um, and there's a number of other um, uh, small sort of points that we'll include in the notes. Um, I think what we'll do is uh, I wanna 
leave room for questions. So I have, uh, we've reached the end of the presentation and I've included on this slide, both Elaine and my uh, contact information. Um, you know, please feel free to reach out to us um, with any additional questions. And now I'm going to uh, attempt to pull up the chat. So just give me one second. So far, it looks like we haven't gotten new questions in yet from the chat. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to share. And while, while that's while people have time to do that, I just wanted to say thank you so much for for joining us today. Um, you know, DREDF continues to build on our advocacy in this area. And um, of course, we welcome uh, folks reaching out to us. Um, and we just we want to say that we really appreciate your support. And uh, we look forward to continuing to provide these types of trainings uh, in the future. Um, we have one question about the, the Gibbler case. Uh, I do see that. And, and so the, uh, the Giebler case uh, is essentially um, that um, a person with a disability, it's a, it is a fair housing case. Um, and so a person with a disability was renting a, uh, was attempting to rent a, a unit and they did not meet the um, financial uh, qualifications for, for renting the unit. So they made a request to uh, utilize their, their relative as a co-signer. And, um, and we can get the spelling for you. And so essentially the court found that you know, even though this was an accommodation related to the person with the disabilities um, ability to sort of meet the financial um, policies of the uh, housing uh, program, that the, uh, that the accommodation was essentially still reasonable. And so it, it's, it is a very helpful case, um, both in, you know, the fair housing context and also in terms of, um, criminalization of homelessness uh, that, um, you know, some of these enforcements have um, financial ramifications. So uh, considering Giebler in this context can, can be helpful. Um, okay, we've got another question coming in that says, with rulings that put stipulation around enforcement, like there must be notice given and adequate offer of shelter before an encampment sweep, how did these lawsuits go about proving that those were not happening? Um, sorry, this is a long question. Um, we know. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, please, please, Elaine. Please. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I would say that, especially in, in the Venucci case, for example, the plaintiffs were often in, uh, the, the advocates were often in contact with the plaintiffs um, who were, you know, continually, continuing, continually in the middle of, of being swept um, from their encampments and, um, and so I, I think even in those contexts where sometimes reasonable accommodations were being made, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't for every person, 
um, basically there was no policy in place. Um, I think, you know, just, just like the person in the question has said, just, you know, remaining in constant contact with your, um, with your plaintiffs, with your, with your, your folks on the ground and just trying to build out, build out those facts that this indeed is not happening. And yeah, so just to echo um, what Sydney said, it, the people who have firsthand experience with what's happening in terms of enforcement um, can provide uh, evidence about their personal experiences. Um, also, you can look at the policies as written and look at how they um, intersect with what's actually happening. So for example, in Martin, there was actually a policy that said they would not enforce the ordinance as long as the shelters didn't report, as long if the shelters reported that they were full. One of the shelters at issue had a policy to never say they were full, um, despite the fact that they had a limited beds. They just said that they wouldn't turn anyone away, even though they also had a policy that said certain people couldn't stay there. And so the court and Martin looked beyond that, the fact that it said they wouldn't turn people away to the actual policies at place and the mechanisms for determining that. Um, colleagues, this is Claudia. There's a question in the Q&A. Um, we are challenging practices of sweeps. There are no ordinances that we are challenging. Our judge recently denied a PI because he did not know how to apply these cases to practices rather than ordinances. How do we successfully challenge practices? Are there cases we can point to to best educate our judge? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, We'd have to get back to you on specific, you know, questions around that. Um, I think I think yeah. the other piece too is that, um, you know, the Title II um, prohibits uh, programs or activities. You know, it's if if a if a jurisdiction is. Uh, doing an activity that is discriminatory, you know, the ADA can provide redress for that. And so um, even, you know, even if, even if it's just a policy. And so I think that, um, you know, I would, I would, I, I would suggest that um, whoever asked this question, if you could please um, email uh, Elaine or I, um, or both of us, um, email us this question and we can, uh, we're, we're definitely willing to dig a little deeper with you um, to find some, some, some case law and some, some additional answers. Um, this is Claudia with DREDF, just um, letting people know that the recording will be made available to everyone once the captions are added. Um, and corrected and uh, the slides will be made available and case citations will be made available. Well, thanks everyone. I think that's gonna wrap this training for, for the day. I wanna thank our uh, ASL interpreter, Brandon, and of course our captioner, Terry, and um, we will definitely get this uh, PowerPoint out to folks as soon as possible. Uh, thanks again, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their week. And as a reminder, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are a support center, so feel free to reach out to us. Uh, that's what we're here for. If you have questions or any ways that we can provide technical assistance or guidance, we're happy to help. Thank you.